uh, can improve the, uh, the signal information that you're transmitting through is a nominee. Okay, guys. Um, so our next speaker is Christian Machens from the Champalimont Center of the uh, for the Unknown. And he will talk about quality areas interact through a communication suspects. All right. Um, so first, thanks to uh, Fritz and Terry for organizing the workshop. It's been very interesting. Um, so it's a pleasure being here. Uh, there's one thing that kind of happened is that initially, my understanding was I was going to give a half an hour talk. <laughs> and then I was very lucky to figure out, actually, I have one hour time. And so the question was, should I just stretch this talk, you know, speak half as fast or introduce more details? But I, I think I decided maybe a bit similar to Tali to like uh, take a bit more of a high level perspective and embed it in a, in a bit more context. And so I'm going to talk about linear readouts and uh, their surprising consequences. I understand that some of you are maybe more from computer science, so maybe I should first define what I mean by a linear readout. Um, so here's the way I would define a linear readout. So you have a bunch of neurons, and they're spiking. Okay, these will be the spike trains. In the linear readout, it's basically the following procedure. You filter the spike trains, for instance, just by an exponential kernel, a Gaussian kernel, or whatnot, a way of basically extracting something that I would call the instantaneous firing rate. And then you linearly combine all these instantaneous firing rates through a, a, a decoder or decoder matrix to basically get linear readouts. Those are analog quantities, okay? That's a concept that has been used in neuroscience for uh, actually quite a long time. I trace it back to Georgopoulos, but you may correct me. There may have been people before that that used that. And so the question is, why do I care? And I care for the following reason. Because one of the frustrating things in systems neuroscience is that basically it always seems everything is fair game. Everything can be played around with. It's not like we have a neuron model that we can all agree on. You know, people use firing rate neurons, they use integrating fire neurons, they use conducting space neurons. There's not a connectivity that we can agree on. Maybe there will be soon, but we have feedforward networks, we have recurrent networks. So you can play around with so many things um, that it is a bit frustrating. But what I sort of discovered, at least in my work, is that there's basically one invariant, one thing that I've been not playing around with for 10 years, not intentionally in some sense, it's rather with hindsight that I noticed, I always keep coming back to that concept. There never has been a reason for me to not use it, and that is basically the linear readout, okay? And so you'll see it pop up in my talk. Um, so I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, three topics. First, I'm gonna talk about single populations, single populations of neurons in higher order areas, such as the prefrontal cortex, and how you can disentangle representations that look very complex on the single cell level essentially using linear readouts. Then I'm going to talk about two populations at the same time, recordings from V1 and V2. We're trying to understand how one population feeds into the next population. So it's about inter-area communication. And then I'm going to give a teaser, just a few minutes, okay, about some work that uh, uh, I've been doing with Sophie Deneff, um, which is about how a linear readout, if you combine it with a principle of efficiency, actually can explain things such as uh, excitatory inhibitory balance in networks and robustness of neural networks in general. So let's start with the first topic, disentangling representations in higher order areas. And this is work that I, I've mostly done with uh, a, po a former postdoc in the lab, Dimitri Kobach, and a graduate student, Wieland Brendel, who are the ones that actually, in some sense, um, I'd say, went through the math and invented the method that we're now using to disentangle these uh, representations. So here's the problem that we started out with, um, I guess by now more than 10 years ago. And it's the following. You have a recording from a monkey, higher order area, it's the prefrontal cortex, an area that is in some sense considered an executive area, where things come together, you know, where working memory comes together, sensor information comes together, actions are being chosen. That's one way of thinking about it. So it's a fairly high-order high area in the brain. And here you have a monkey that is doing a very simple task. What the monkey is basically doing is getting a vibratory stimulus frequency on its fingertip, frequency F1. Then there's delay for uh, three seconds. Then it gets a second vibratory stimulus frequency. 
And then it has to decide whether F1 is larger than F2 or not. So it's a very simple working memory task. Um, and here you have a single neuron from the prefrontal cortex recorded by uh, Ranulfo Romo. And that's basically on the x-axis. You have time. On the y-axis, you have the time-varying firing rate, the instantaneous firing rate. In this case, averaged over trials. So it's a, it's a PSTH. And the different colors represent different stimulus frequencies F1. Okay, so it goes from F1 being 10 hertz all the way to F1 being 34 hertz. So these are for different, uh, uh, different task conditions. And what you see is for this neuron, you know, initially, before the first stimulus frequency comes on, it's actually firing with a background rate of 20 hertz. Then these colors spread out. So this neuron now carries information about that first stimulus frequency F1. Then that information persists in this delay period of three seconds where the, where the monkey has to memorize, has to uh, remember the first stimulus frequency. And then afterwards, we now sort trials according to the decision that the monkey is going to make. So whether it decides yes or no, you know, the F1 was larger than F2 or not. And you nicely see this decision actually arising here. The monkey is actually pressing the button later on. So this is kind of predictive of the decision that he's going to make. And that's just a single neuron in PFC. Now, everything would be very simple if all neurons in the prefrontal cortex were like that. But unfortunately, that's not the case. If you look across neurons, then it starts looking a lot more complex. Um, so you have different types of uh, different neurons. And you see you know, some of them uh, don't care a lot about the first stimulus frequency. They just have some interesting dynamics. Some of them uh, do care about the first stimulus frequency, but then there's nothing about the decision. Some of them basically have suddenly decision-related activities, such as this one here, but they didn't have any short-term memory. So you get all kinds of uh, complexity. And so this has sometimes been termed a mixed selectivity in single cells. And it's been a great problem for people that want to analyze data in these higher order areas, because what are you supposed to make of it? Okay. In some sense, one of the first things I did when I had this data set, it had like 1,000 neurons, is just print them all out one by one. And it's not super illuminating if you do that. You sort of notice you know, there are sort of common recurring patterns. But it's not like you find two neurons that do exactly the same thing. Every neuron is a bit different. So one conclusion one can draw from this is that really looking at single cells in some sense must be irrelevant. And we have to understand what is going on on a higher level, on the level of the population of neurons. Now, if we do that, then we come basically to this idea that we've already uh, heard of several times of neural manifolds. That maybe what's happening if you have several neurons, such as neuron 1, 2, 3, the firing rates here, and you trace out the activity of uh, these neurons over time, that these activities you know, don't lie in the full high dimensional space of population activities, but they lie within some kind of uh, manifold that we may want to characterize. Now, uh, Ila nicely talked about how to characterize a manifold if you don't assume you have any other types of information except for the uh, population activity. But I, what I want to do in some sense is ask, OK, can we assign some type of meaning to such a manifold uh, in, a, in, a, in a more supervised or semi-supervised way? And what do I mean with meaning? So one way of thinking about meaning is to say, OK, let's assume we move around on that manifold then we can interpret such a move on the manifold as actually a change in a linear readout, where the linear readout, again, is basically just a linear combination of the firing rates of the neurons. So imagine that, you, that the firing rates of the population were to move in this particular direction. Then maybe that would correlate with a change in an external stimulus that the animal is basically observing. You could imagine that uh, the firing rates moving in another direction could be a change in the decision that the animal is uh, making. Okay. So let's assume that's the picture of how it actually works in populations of neurons. Okay, so that's an assumption. If that works, then maybe the way you would want to analyze the data in some sense is with these multiple linear readouts. So you would say, you know, I take the firing rates of these neurons, and what I have to figure out are the right way of reading out the information from this population such that I can separate out information about, say, the stimulus, information about the decision that an animal may make an action, information about something else, say like a reward that the animal is getting, etc. Okay? That's what you would want to do. So we set out to basically do that, but since we're theorists, we wanted to do a little bit more. So our first goal is really just to choose readouts that demix these uh, dependencies on the task parameters. So you say, okay, you have these neurons, and I'm illustrating the mixed selectivity just by a pie chart 
which basically says every neuron may have information about, say, stimulus, decision, reward, whatever you want, um, and they mix the information in different ways. And what you would want to do is you would want to choose those readouts such that it demixes the information, okay? So that you have a readout that says, oh, you know, this one only cares about the stimulus, this one only cares about the decision, this one only cares about the reward, etc. cetera. Um, but as a theorist, that alone does not make me happy um, because really one of the reasons to analyze data is because you just want to see what's there. And one problem with just reading out information is that you may lose a lot of stuff that you don't look for, okay? So the other thing that we wanted is we wanted to say, okay, we want this readout to also be a bottleneck in the sense that it captures everything that is going on in the data. And I guess part of the reason we ended up with this is also because we initially came from principal component analysis, which is exactly that. You know, you try to reduce the dimensionality of your data, but keep as much as possible, and then chose to also keep this information or like choose your components in such a way that they demix these different bits of information. So these were the two goals, basically. Demix the information through a bunch of linear readouts, but also make sure that the bottleneck that we create actually captures everything that is going on in the data set. Um, and we call the, the uh, method demix principal component analysis. Um, <clears throat> the, the version I'm going to talk about today is the one from 2016 that does not have an orthogonality constraint on the, on the uh, uh, decoding and encoding stages. And here is, a, is a, in a nutshell, basically, how it works. So how we figure out these correct readouts that demix information but capture everything that's going on. So what we're going to do is we're going to take our single neurons and we're going to decompose their PSDHs into these different bits of information that we care about. And so these are single neurons from this working memory task that I just explained. So again, you have time here. This is the firing rate of the neuron. This is the single neuron, the PSDH. The different colors correspond to the different stimulus frequencies, F1, that the monkey got. And then here, dashed versus solid corresponds to the decision that the monkey is going to make. So what we're going to do is we're first of all just going to take the average of that PSDH. We're going to subtract that average. And then we're going to average out the stimuli and the decisions. If we average over stimuli and decisions, then what we get is something that you could call the condition-independent part. It just keeps track of the overall time, uh, uh, the overall change over time of this PSDH. But it eliminates stimulus and decision information. Now you can subtract that one too. And average just over the decision. So this is a binary decision, but if you average over it, there will be something that we now call the stimulus-dependent part. Okay? You can subtract that too, and now you can average over the stimulus. If you average over the stimulus, then what you get is the decision-dependent part, okay? And then, after you subtracted all of these, there's something left, and that would be any kind of interaction between stimulus and decision that could not be captured in this averaging procedure, okay? That's the key idea. So this decomposition of data into what we call marginalized averages, it wasn't actually invented by us. It also exists in the MANOVA literature. We're just going to take it uh, as a start for another means. So we do this not just for this particular neuron. We'll do it for all of the neurons, OK? <coughs> we do it for all of the neurons. And the nice thing is that this decomposition is unique and that you, once you have these uh, decomposed parts, you can always reconstruct the individual neurons. And now we're going to do the following thing. We're going to say, OK, we want to start with a full population activity. So that will be these neurons here on the left-hand side. And we want to find, basically, a set of readouts, a decoder, that takes this population activity into a bottleneck, okay, which we're going to call the demix stimulus components, such that with this bottleneck, you can reconstruct the stimulus-dependent part of the PSDHs. Okay? So these components become the demix stimulus components, because you're not trying to reconstruct the full PSDH. You're only trying to reconstruct the stimulus-dependent part that we got from these marginalized averages. And the method by which you can find this bottleneck is basically reduced rank regression, um, which is essentially linear regression under a rank constraint. 
So you have multiple inputs, multiple outputs. See it as a linear regression model, but you take a rank constraint on the regression coefficients, and those rank constraints give you this bottleneck. And if you do it for this particular example, then these are the DMIX stimulus components that you get. So these would be two components that allow you to take the original PSD ages and from them reconstruct only the stimulus dependent part. And then you can do that, of course, for the decision dependent part, for the condition independent part, for the interaction part, etc. And by doing it for all of these parts separately, you get a basis that allows you to reconstruct the whole data, okay, which is what we want uh, to do, uh, set out to do. So what does this method give us for the uh, monkey data? So if we apply it to the monkey data, <coughs> then here's the way it looks. <clears throat> so again, this is the somatosensory working memory task, prefrontal cortex. What I'm showing you here is the number of components that we extract versus the cumulative explained variance. In black, you see PCA. PCA provides a, 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 an upper bound for any kind of linear compression. And then in red, you see DMX PCA. And you see that we don't lose a lot by choosing a slightly different basis from PCA. Then what you see here is basically how much each of these basis components now cares about different aspects of the task. So the gray are basically what we call the condition independent components, so the ones that only vary with the timing of the task. The blue are the stimulus dependent components, and the red are the decision components. And what is somewhat surprising is that, in fact, only 11% of the variance has anything to do with the stimulus and decision, and a lot of the variance has to do with something else. Okay? Um, and so what does that mean? Let me actually show you the components. So here are the components. These are these condition-independent components, and they really generally just have something to do with the timing of the task. And they're very strong. They dominate the overall activity. These are the stimulus-dependent components. Okay, so they only care about the stimulus, and you don't see, you see very, very little decision information in these stimulus-dependent components. And these are the decision-dependent components. And one thing that tells you is that on the population level, you can find readouts that completely extract the stimulus information and separate it out from the decision information. Question? So just before you go on, I, I wanted to clarify how you um, go through it and look at just the stimulus-dependent or the decision-dependent parts. Is this something that falls out of your analysis, or are you somehow um, constraining the rank based on how many stimuli you have? Or um, so you have to put in what you're going to look for. So when you construct these marginalized averages, you average over different task parameters. Right. You have to say what those task parameters are. So, so you just labeled your data with various task parameters and decisions. Right. And then, uh, say, I, I want this many things out, and then... Exactly. Okay. Exactly. That's exactly how it and works. And then afterwards, you post hoc label which ones are decision and, and stimulus, or...? So there I don't understand what you mean with post hoc. Well, so the, I mean, you have the labeling already. Oh, you have labeling. Uh, right, so because you measured it as the experimenter, you, you kept track of the stimuli, you kept track of the decisions. Um, so the labels are there. Now, which labels you include in the analysis, that's basically up to you. It'll depend on what you recorded in an experiment. It'll also depend on the amount of data you have. You cannot just include, like, uh, too many labels. But just, just generally to say what this is, it's... I mean, there are, there are unsupervised methods where you basically just look at the population activity, you just look at the manifold. There could be supervised methods where you try to, you know, use the population activity to fit something, such as a stimulus or something, or use the stimulus to fit the population activity. This, in some sense, is a semi-supervised method, okay? It's, it's, it, it combines unsupervised together with, a, with some information about these uh, task parameters, so it's a, it's a semi-supervised method. <coughs> okay. So one of the things you may wonder about is, you know, why is 90% of the activity in these condition-independent components? And there's one way I like to think about it. It's not necessarily the most popular with experimentalists, um, but that is the following. So imagine that in this task, the population activity in the prefrontal cortex actually does move around in this particular manifold. But not all movements in this manifold are experimentally controlled. In fact, experimentally controlled in this particular uh, experiment is really just the stimulus frequency F1, the stimulus frequency F2, the decision, and that's pretty much it. But it could be that there are many other things that the monkey is doing that are just not experimentally controlled. Could, for instance, just be the breathing. Maybe the breathing 
you know, uh, rhythmically uh, uh, varies with the tasks. People have shown that in fMRI experiments, subjects tend to rhythmicize their breathing, breathing with, a, with a, a timing of a task. Imagine the monkey taps his foot every single time the first stimulus frequency comes. Some type of superstitious learning, you know, happens in rodents at least. Um, and, but you didn't monitor the tapping of the foot. Okay? There could be many parameters that you're actually not monitoring, things that the monkey does, that the monkey may even think are important for solving that task, okay? that change along this manifold. And since they're hidden or uncontrolled, they will just show up as these condition-independent components. Okay? And one thing that is kind of interesting, so I don't have a slide here, but if you apply this method to more sensory or more motor areas, what you actually see is that the amount of variance that goes into the condition-independent component decreases. So it's as if this would tell us that we understand these sensory and these motor areas much better than these very executive areas, or that we can control them better, let's put it this way, that we have a better idea of how to control activity in these areas. Yeah. Yeah. Just to go back to the previous slide, should, should we interpret your linear readout as working only in the tangent space to that manifold? Yes. Yeah. Well, um, yes, so the, the, the manifold picture is... Uh, the one you just had in the previous slide. Yeah, yeah. So I'm, I'm putting up a manifold, and that is a, that is a bit of a separate discussion. Um, strictly speaking, since we use this type of method, it's really a subspace. Mm -hmm. okay. um, but I think there are good arguments, we come, come back to this at the end of the talk, that obviously it's not a linear subspace but it can still be a linear readout, okay? Yeah. Is it surprising to you that uh, not, like the decision component doesn't say anything until that timing of the, the go queue? Like, like the monkey did it, you know, because the monkey could decide, you know, two seconds in that I want to do. The, that is true. So the monkey, if the monkey were to ignore the task, the monkey could decide whenever that it wants to press the left or the right button. If it does it, though, you know, then it'll only get a reward in 50% of the trials. So waiting until the end of the, of the delay period ensures that the decision is the correct decision for the reward. Well, yeah, but, I mean, but like, if you're looking at the neurons, you, you, know, you might imagine that like, the neurons make the decision to go left at two seconds and then... So, so, so let me maybe clarify the task. So the task is you have a first stimulus frequency of one that comes in here. And then where you see the decision, that's actually when the second stimulus frequency comes in. And you have to compare F1 with F2. And only if you properly compare the two can you make the right decision. So the decision occurring here basically means the monkey is actually doing the task. If the decision was occurring earlier, the monkey would kind of ignore the task and just decide, you know, a priori I'm going to hit one of the two buttons, which would not be a, a good strategy if you want to really collect as much reward as you want. Yeah. So you use two examples, foot tapping and, I guess, breathing as uncontrolled um, behaviors in an experimental setup. I guess I don't see why you have to invoke that per se and not just say the contingencies of that area to, for the dynamics of the task are necessarily set up in such a way. And that's already enough to say that there will be condition-independent dynamics or condition-independent signal that's not part of it. Um, that is true. So you're right. You know, like there can just be, there could be other reasons to explain this, con or there could be other reasons why you would have this condition-independent <laughs> dynamics. I'm just suspicious. So if I emphasize the thing with the breathing and the tapping of the foot, or if you want attention, motivation, or any kind of internal signal, it kind of I means I'm suspicious that some of that activity actually has meaning. That's all. So I heard uh, Ann Churchill give a talk just a few days ago, um, and she has a task, not as a, as a rat or a mouse, I think, actually, but uh, a rodent that was doing some kind of choice task, and, uh, and, and you know, they're, they're recording from uh, various places and trying to decode just the way you're doing it. And in addition to the recording, they also had a video of, of the mouse, and they used variables from you know, the, the, the position of the, the legs and so forth. And it turns out that there, there was actually a lot of information from the, the video, just exactly the way you described it, which is that there is a, a highly correlated body movement before a tap to the right. Right. 
And so, it, it, you know, that, that obviously has to be represented to the brain, which means that there's some other uh, background information there that uh, is, is part of the whole uh, representation. Right, right. No, that's, that's great, actually. And I absolutely agree. I would say that if I was a monkey person now, I would say that's rodent stuff. Okay, <laughs> um, okay I'll, take, I'll take two more questions, and I want to move on. Maybe uh, you and you. How are the neurons recorded? How were the neurons recorded? recorded? So this is with uh, seven movable electrodes. So they're not simultaneously recorded. It's a pooled uh, data set. And then it's basically day after day after day. So it's a, it's a very highly overtrained monkey. Can you tell the difference between, say, excitatory neurons and inhibitory neurons? No. No? Well, based on, yeah, okay. based, on, based on waveform, but actually we don't have that information. We have the information in another data set. Um, and then when we do this analysis, actually we didn't see any difference between the putatively excitatory and putatively inhibitory neurons. They actually look exactly the same on the population level. I don't know how many monkeys you have here, but I'm guessing that if you put monkey in as a factor, you probably, a lot of those bars would be sort of subject. So this is just. Specific differences that might characterize their particular way that they uh, like to solve the test. So that is actually not, so this is, a, this is actually pooled over two monkeys, okay. um, just to make prettier plots. But you can also plot it monkey by monkey. Yeah. And it looks surprisingly the same. Okay, so there's, a, there's an invariance basically on the population level. Um, there are some changes on the overall variance, et cetera, but the, but the main components come out exactly the same. So it's as if the, the monkeys learn all the same task in some sense. So let me move on. So let me just say, you know, we've applied this to, to more. Uh, this is one thing I wanted to say. So you may wonder, you know, could it be that we have these different components because they're just separate classes of neurons? Maybe some classes care, care more about the stimulus, some classes care more about the decision. And if you just look at the way you have to, the, the encoding weights, the way you reconstruct the neurons from these components, um, and this is a, these are the distributions for the different components, then you see, you know, it's always kind of like a sparse Laplacian type distribution, um, which means on the single neuron level, it's really a mixture of these components. Okay, it's a random mixture of these components. That's the way the single neuron level looks. And that's why the single neuron level looks so complicated. Now, this is just to flash up, you know, we've applied this to many tasks. And one of the nice things is that in these different tasks, you basically always get a snapshot of what's happening on the population level. So you don't have to look at the single cells. Okay, but to summarize this, <coughs> um, basically what we've seen is that at the population level, simple linear readouts allow us to demix things that look quite complicated on the single cell level. Okay, you these complicated task dependencies on the single cell level, you kind of disappear if you look at the population level just using a, a simple linear readout. So the next thing I wanted to talk about is moving from, yeah? One quick question. So, um, so you, you, tra you, you did this, uh, this method basically on the PSTHs, right? Yes, that's right. Uh, so once you trained, uh, you trained this, can you use this to do actually a single trial readout? Or I mean, does this help you to, um, is there kind of a denoising property if you use now this decoder in um, single trials? So if you had simultaneous recordings of oh, neurons. Right. You, right, because this is not simultaneous. Uh, so the, the reason we use PSDH is precisely because it's not simultaneous. In fact, if you have simultaneous recordings, then you should use the method on the simultaneous recordings. Um, and so what I want to talk about next is basically moving up from one population to two populations. Um, and this is a, a work that was mostly done by a, a graduate student that I share with uh, Byron Yu, actually, Byron Yu from Carnegie Mellon, that's Shuao Sumedu. So he's the one who did all the analysis. And it's on data from Adam Cohn's lab, uh, collected by Amin uh, Sanfakili. And the question is the following. The question is basically, okay, let's assume we had simultaneous recordings from uh, two areas. What do we think about the way they communicate? So on the theory side, um, I would say the, the simplest thing, the simplest way of which you can think about area communication would really just be a standard feedforward network, the way uh, uh, Tali has described it this morning. And in a standard feedforward network, basically, um, everything is communicated, unless, of course, you compress the information then there is information loss through, comp uh, through compression. Um, but one of the things we, we sort of know about the brain is that, you know, 
it seems that not always everything is communicated. So there is, a, there is something like sometimes called the bit of routing problem. And actually Bruno had some uh, nice work on this in the 90s. And then the question is, how do you select information that you communicate to a downstream areas? What if you don't just want to communicate everything all the time? What if you say there's a context? Now I want to communicate, say, the visual information. And now I want to communicate the auditory information. But I don't always want to have everything in a higher order area. Okay? So then I think a more classical way of thinking about this, how to change what you communicate from one area to another, is basically to change the connectivity of the two areas. That seems like the most straightforward way of doing it. And one way of doing that, um, and I hope I don't misrepresent you, Bruno, is basically that you, that you do it through control units. This is also what Chris Eliasmus actually uses in his uh, sort of elaborate uh, model of the whole human brain, use control units that nonlinear modify basically what you're going to communicate. Um, on the experimental side, there isn't actually a very much work on inter-area communication because the technology hasn't existed. So there's work on the neuron-to-neuron -neuron level where people record two neurons in two different areas and then they could look at cross correlations. There's a lot of work about LFPs where the LFP is basically the local field potential. So it's, it's a summary signal that you extract from a whole bunch of neurons in one area. And there's also a lot of work on recording LFPs in different areas. And People that have studied that usually say, you know, the way areas communicate is through synchronization. They may synchronize uh, oscillations within the two areas, and then spikes kind of uh, uh, are transmitted on the, on the peaks of these oscillations. Uh, so there's a theory called communication through coherence, um, or some ideas, basically, that say how area-to-area -area communication is supposed to work. So what we set out to do is basically look at two populations and see what can we learn from that if we have population recordings in two areas. And the areas that we used is basically V1. So they're simultaneous recordings with the Utah array from the output layers of V1, and then with tetrodes from the input layers of V2. So that's shown here in the Marquardt brain. So you have a Utah array that basically records in V1, and then there are tetrodes that basically pierce through the cortex to reach uh, areas in V2. And one of the nice things about using V1 and V2 is that you have retinotopy. So you can kind of make sure that the two areas you're recording actually are communicating. Because you know, just because they're two areas doesn't actually mean that all the neurons are communicating with all the neurons. But with retinotopy, you have good chances of saying, OK, maybe those neurons are actually communicating. Um, and that's kind of shown here. So here you have these blue dots, uh, neurons in V1, shown basically uh, in the visual field. And the centers are the centers of the receptive fields. The receptive fields generally have the type of size that's shown by this blue circle here. And then the red neurons are neurons recorded in V2 using these tetrode recordings. And the red circle shows you the uh, size of the receptive field in V2. Yes? Go back to the previous slide. Yes. What, what is it you're recording uh, with the tetrodes? What are we recording with the tetrodes? We're recording axons in the white matter with the tetrodes. <coughs> No, 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 we are recording the uh, input layers of uh, V2. That's the key idea, basically. So you should record, in my opinion, <laughs> from somatas. So the, 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 the tips of the uh, tetrodes are in Yes, the exactly, yes. And um, um, just to also show evidence that this actually worked, so I don't have the, I don't have the slides on this because this is actually uh, work from Adam Cohn's lab, but what they did is just uh, do cross-correlations between uh, neurons that are pairwise recorded, and you see that several of them actually have a nice two millisecond peak. So, I mean, I always find this surprising. You know, you, you peak in, you subsample heavily from these populations, you take two of these electrodes, and you see, well, that looks like a direct connection. You know, with just a two millisecond uh, delay, you see a peak that says, you know, V2 neuron fired exactly two millisecond after V1 neuron. Okay. So basically, the advantage here is that you know, V2 is actually the major target for V1 output. You have these retinotopic <laughs> maps to kind of align your recordings to a certain extent. So here's the way we're going to analyze the data. So um, we're going to basically take a population vector. And in this case, we're going to quantify it as a spike count. And I'll be happy to explain later why you know, we don't use a more uh, uh, a finer uh, resolution in time, so it'll be a 100 millisecond uh, spike count. And then we go through basically a, a stimulation period here. So there's a one second stimulation where this grating is shown. Okay? And if you do that, 
and you do it over many, many, many trials, then what you get is a lot of variability in the response of the V1 population. And that variability is basically shown here. So each of these dots basically is a 100 millisecond time window, um, either by sliding it through uh, constant stimulation, but also by going over many trials. I think on average, there are like 200, 300 trials in one of the experiments. It's an anesthetized monkey. Um, <clears throat> so okay. is each dot a trial? Each dot is, in some sense, we could call it a trial, but actually a single stimulus presentation is one second, and a dot here is 100 milliseconds. So there are really 10 dots per trial, if you want. Yeah, from a single trial. Yeah. So one way we think about this data is in the following. We say, OK, what we're looking here is there's a, is a mean operating point, okay, a mean activity, and we have fluctuations around that mean activity. And we're going to say, like, these fluctuations on, on the population level, they aren't super, uh, super huge. Okay? So we're going to think of these fluctuations as a way of exploring um, how changes in V1 activity are going to affect V2 activity. So let's just think about it for a second. So one thing we see here is really there's a, there's a dominant dimension along which the V1 activity fluctuates, and that's this one. So I put down a dominant dimension here, but it's really, you can think about this as the type of manifold that we had uh, earlier. Uh, the manifold of activity, you know, the manifold on which the activity in V1 lies. Okay? I'm just going to call it dominant dimension or dominant dimensions now. So where the V1 activity uh, moves around. But now let's think about V2. So what does V2 add? Let's just think about a single neuron in V2. So what we can do is we can color code the V2, the activity of that single neuron for each of these uh, V1 population activities. So this is a, a schematic here. But basically what it's supposed to illustrate is, you know, when the V1 activity was over here, the neuron was not firing. And as you move in this direction, the V2 neuron starts firing a lot. Okay? So that gives rise to the idea of a predictive dimension. So this is a dimension in the V1 activity that when activity changes in that direction, the activity of a V2 neuron is affected. Okay? And, yeah? Just a quick question. So is there any reason why you're taking the mean activity here instead of looking at the trajectory, the typically the whole temporal dynamics as you did with the PFC? Um, so in some sense, I would say it's because the stimulus is a static stimulus. It's totally true that eventually you would want to go to like time varying activity. So I would say at this point, we're just making our lives easier. Yeah, that's the main reason. So the one thing I want to illustrate this way is um, that, well, first of all, I want to say predictive dimensions, you could, for instance, just think about you get them by using linear regression. Okay? If you do linear regression here, then what this direction illustrates are the regression coefficients that you would use if you were to try to predict the V2 neuron from the activity of the V1 population. That's what this is supposed to illustrate. But what should be clear is that a priori, there's no reason that the dominant dimensions on which basically activity changes in this manifold in V2 has anything to do with the dimensions by which you can predict activity in V2. Okay, a priori, this may be different. So now let's think about predicting the V2 population, not just a single V2 neuron. So here I show you one neuron. You can imagine that you know, another neuron may take up V1 activity in a different direction. So I'm going to call that a different predictive dimension. And then you can sort of add all the neurons in V2, okay? And what you basically see is, uh, is that, you know, for each neuron you get a different direction. But now you may wonder, do all these directions truly span the full V1 activity space? So that everything that is happening in V1 being communicated to V2? Or could it be that the predictive dimensions span a subspace? So could it be that you see the V1 neurons actually, uh, lie, the V2 neurons only respond to activity that changes in a particular manifold in V1 that may not be the dominant manifold, okay? So that's what we set out to test. And so uh, to include some terminology, we're going to call this the communication subspace in the sense that we say this is the V1 activity that fluctuates on this manifold is being communicated to V2. Whereas activity in V1 that fluctuates orthogonally to that manifold will not be communicated to V2. So we're going to call that uh, private. We're going to say there could be private activity in V1 that V2 never sees, and then there's activity that V2 sees. We're going to call that communicated activity or communication subspace. <clears throat> now, one thing that you may wonder about, you know, that's all kind of cool, but 
is there really anything special between communication between two areas? So to, to figure that out, just a second, we, we introduced a control. We said, let's actually see whether whatever we find, whether it has any kind of relevance. And so we decided to basically take a subset of the V1 neurons, of the recorded V1 neurons, that is matched in size and firing rate distribution to these V2 neurons, we call it a holdout, okay, that we extracted from the source V1 population, and we call that target V1. And that'll be our control, because we want to see whether there's anything special about V1, V2 communication. So we put up this arbitrary subset of target V1 neurons that'll tell us whether inter-intra-area communication is actually any different from inter-area communication. So in the previous slide, the cartoon slide, um, how the downstream region, in this case V2, will also be in some state. And its state, its contextual state, if you will, will determine what it can or cannot listen to. So how should, or what it should or should not pay attention to. So how should I think about that component of this problem with respect to the hypothesis you laid out here? So I guess the, the hypothesis we have in some sense is that V2 acts like a readout on V1. And the readout itself, we're going to keep that constant. So we don't assume that you know V2 can twist around its readout. So that's uh, the underlying assumption. And if you take that assumption, then that problem that you just described doesn't really uh, arrive, arise. Um, but we can talk about it later, whether it makes sense or not. Yeah? I mean, related to what you just said, I mean, there are recurrent connections. V2 also talks back to V1. So isn't that kind of breaking, in some sense, your assumption? Uh, that makes everything a lot more complicated. That is totally true. Um, because you're right, you know, eventually there'll be feedback. So we think of this as a feed-forward system. Um, so one, one reason to do that is really because the uh, feed-forward connection, so we have the, the output of V1 and the input of V2. These are the layers that we record. The feedback, though, goes through a different layer. So there'll be a little bit, uh, it's not as direct, let's put it this way, but it'll also uh, come along. So there's some other work we did actually to sort of try to uh, disentangle the feed-forward and the feedback a little bit, but I don't have the slide. I can show those slides later. Is, and what you see actually is there that the feed forward really arises at the beginning of the stimulus with a two millisecond delay. And then at the end of the stimulus, so like after half a second, you see a, 20, a, a much more sluggish with a 20 millisecond delay type of feedback arising. And you can figure that out by basically look, looking at um, cross correlations, not between neurons, but between populations using canonical correlation analysis on very fine time bands. And then you actually see there's a feedback component. It's not as strong as the feed-forward component, but it exists. But for this, I'm just going to ignore it now. OK? OK, so we have this uh, uh, control, the target V1. And here are the results. So let's start first with just predicting all the V2 uh, neurons from the V1 activity just using linear regression. So we use the full linear regression <coughs> model it's properly regularized, et cetera. I'm showing you the test uh, performance. And you see that basically, on average, you can explain something like, in this case, 13.5% of the variance of V2 from the V1 population. So the first question you may ask is, like, 13.5% of the variance, that does not seem like a lot, OK? Um, it turns out, though, that we have to think again. You know, we have, like, roughly 100 V1 neurons here. We have 25 V2 neurons. These populations are heavily subsampled. And if you just assume subsampling, so you build a simple linear model with subs and then you subsample from it and do linear regression, then this performance is actually surprisingly consistent with that. The performance is also surprisingly consistent with just assuming you have 100 V1 neurons, 25 V2 neurons, but they're not linearly coupled. They're linear Poisson models, so you put a Poisson process afterwards. Also degenerates your performance a lot. So I'm actually, initially I was like, well, you know, we're digging around in the noise. But now I'm very convinced this actually is actually surprisingly high in some sense for just linear regression. Okay. So this is the full linear regression model. Now, as I said, we wanted to ask whether actually V2 really reads out everything from V1 or it only reads out a subspace. So to test that, we're going to go back again to reduced rank regression, which is regression under a rank constraint. And one way to understand this rank constraint is to say, well, it actually introduces something like this communication subspace. 
okay, where V1 activity gets first compressed in, onto this manifold, that is the predictive or communicated manifold, which then gets expanded to explain V2 activity. If you use this root joint regression model and you change the number of predictive dimensions that's shown here, then you see that, well, you know, this is just if you have one predictive dimension, this is if you have two predictive dimensions. And essentially, after two predictive dimensions, you're already as good as the full regression model. So in this particular example, uh, the answer is essentially that how many V1 neuron dimensions do you need to explain V2? Well, you just need two dimensions, okay? So it does indeed look quite flat. Now, this is just uh, one session in, in, in one monkey, so you can basically pool across data. Oh, no. First, we look at the V1 to V1 interaction. And that one is very dis different, and that's the interesting bit. So here, we're just trying to predict V1 neurons from V1 neurons. Here again, that's the full model, very similar to what we had here in terms of the overall possibility to predict things. But then you see now, as you include more and more predictive dimensions, it actually rises much slower. And in this case, you need, what is it, six predictive dimensions to be able to explain uh, V1 activity from V1 activity. Okay, so it's not as low dimensional as V1 to V2. So there's a, a distinct <coughs> difference. This basically shows uh, the uh, whole data set. So here we have the number of predictive dimensions in target V1. This is the number of predictive dimensions in uh, V2. And you generally see we always need more dimensions to predict V1 activity than we need to predict V2 activity. Okay, that's a general outcome. Yeah? Um, so I wonder how much of this is constrained by the uh, stimulus. So we have a pretty good idea of what stimulus features that V1 neurons respond to. And we have some sense of uh, stimulus features that V2 respond to. So if I design a stimulus set such that um, it activates V1 neurons a lot, and it does not activate V2 neurons. So I would expect this analysis to say the communication subspace is, is, is zero. There's, there's no communication subspace. Whereas if I change the, the stimulus space to activate V1 V2 differently, I would get different answers here. Right, so that is, that is an interesting question. So again, to, um, to emphasize, this is for a single stimulus, okay? And the changes we see in V1 activity they are really just uh, shared fluctuations in V1 for a constant stimulus. So the question is, so there are two questions. One is like, why are there shared fluctuations in V1 at all if the stimulus is always the same? You know? And we can talk about that over lunch. Uh, everyone has their own ideas. Um, but you see these uh, shared fluctuations. Then the other question is, what actually happens if you change the stimulus? Okay? Because you could say, oh, let's, instead of just looking at these shared fluctuations and how they are being transmitted to V2, Let's actually manipulate the stimulus and see how that changes V2 activity. That's a much more complicated question, actually, because stimulus space is so big. Let's just say we're trying to explore, Adam Cohen is actually trying to explore that experimentally now, but we haven't analyzed the data yet. But it's a far more complicated question than the question I'm trying to answer here, which is really just fixed stimulus, only the trial to trial variability, shared fluctuations in V1, and how are they being transmitted to V2? So anyways, the, the result here is that if you want to predict V1 activity from V1 activity, you need a lot more dimensions than if you want to predict V2 activity. So one possible confound here could be that, you know, maybe just the V2 activity itself is just lower dimensional. Um, and that surprisingly turns out to be not the case. Exactly the opposite happens. The V2 activity is actually much higher dimensional. So let me explain uh, what I just said. So I said, you know, we find that there are less dimensions we need to predict V2. But what if the manifold on which the V2 activity lives is actually only two-dimensional? Then we kind of trivial that you only need two dimensions, right? Because there isn't anything else to predict. Turns out that's not the case, though. The manifold on which the V2 activity lives is actually higher than the manifold on which the V1 activity lives. Okay, so there's more stuff going on in V2 that we cannot predict with our source V1 population. Uh, we only predict... Uh, uh, a lower dimensional manifold in V2. So V2 is higher dimensional than V1. Or well, it could be that V2 space is more curved, right? Um, it could be that V2 space is more curved. So generally, it's true. So generally, the assumption, again, we make is that while it's likely that the interaction between V1 and V2 is nonlinear, by focusing on a similar stimulus, uh, single stimulus and just the shared fluctuations, it's kind of like a linear approximation onto maybe some kind of nonlinear function. 
But you're right, if that nonlinear function is far too curved, okay, then we're in, uh, in, in trouble. So it's based on the assumption that you know, these shear fluctuations uh, can be well described by a linear model. So if we now basically look at the, uh, at the dimensionality of the populations versus how much dimensions you need to predict them, then here's the result for V1. So this is the dimensionality of the, V1, of the target V1 population, and that's how many dimensions we need to predict it. And the interesting thing is, even though these were estimated by different methods, so there's factor analysis to me uh, measure how many uh, dimensions there are in a population, and then reduce rank regression to measure how many you need to predict the population, you see that in V1, from V1 to V1, this lies nicely on a diagonal. Uh, uh, on a diagonal. So you need as many predictive dimension uh, as there are dimensions in that activity to predict it. So how, what are the closed circles? Uh, are, those are the means uh, of uh, five different sessions. So basically what each of these circles is, is one stimulus, okay? And then there, there are five uh, uh, different sessions and there are eight stimuli for each session, so they're all together 40 points. If you do the same thing with V1 with respect to V2, then you find that, in fact, the number of dimensions that you need to predict uh, the V2 activity is much lower than the number of dimensions that the V2 activity basically has. Okay? So that just summarizes those two results. Now, there are several controls uh, which I'm not going to go to in detail um, that you may wonder about, you know, is this trivial in some sense or is it not trivial? So we claim it's not trivial. So it cannot be explained by, you know, maybe there are actually only a few V2 neurons that even can be predicted in the first place, and that's why you see this. That's not the case. It's actually really a population effect. Maybe this is just trivial because if you assume that the connectivity is not full, but like there's sparse connectivity, there's a physical bottleneck, or there's something in the connectivity, maybe that's a way of explaining this. But it turns out that doesn't give you the results. You could think maybe it's nonlinearities, basically what Sophie said. So, Again, we can only test that in models. So what we did is we did a, a simple complex cell model. So assume there's a quadratic nonlinearity in V2. Um, so you have linear quadratic nonlinearity. So that also doesn't give you the result. You can think maybe it's a subsampling effect. So you can build a big V1, V2 network. You subsample. Again, you don't see this result. <clears throat> then Another thing that you may want to ask is, well, how do these predictive dimensions actually align with the dominant dimensions? Because so far I've only told you, you know, one is bigger than the other, but I haven't said anything about how they align. And that's what I had initially. You know, maybe the dimensions that predict V2 are different from the dimensions of the V1 activity, or maybe not. And it turns out <clears throat> they are different. So here's a way of testing that. So this is basically, we include more and more dimensions to predict V2 activity. That's the predictive performance of V2. This is if you use the predictive dimension, so the, the ideal dimension that you should use to predict V2. So here you're in a, in a, a 3D subspace, basically, and that's all you need for this particular example to predict V2. But you can also say, let's try the dominant dimensions in V1, the dominant subspace in V1 to predict V2. If you do that, then this is the curve you get. So you start with a, with a, with a dimension in V1 along which the activity f changes the most, okay? <coughs> then the, the 2D subspace along which activity changes the most. And you see it actually eventually rises to the same performance, but even after 10 dimensions, you're not entirely there. So it tells you that these predictive dimensions actually are not the dominant modes of V1 activity. On the other hand, if you do a V1, V1 study, then you see that the predictive dimensions are the dominant dimensions, okay? So that's the key difference. So how do we summarize this? So here's a, a simple way of summarizing this graphically. So imagine this is the source V1 activity, the population activity, kind of shown like as a set. And the dark colors show you population activities that occur more often, if you want, okay? Activity patterns that occur more often. Then basically what I've shown you is that the subset of V1 activity that actually predicts V2 lies tilted away from these dominant V1 modes, okay, and it's low dimensional. So there's a smaller subset of the V1 activity that allows you to predict V2. It's, it's lower dimensional and it's tilted away from these dominant dimensions. On the other hand, V1, V1 intra-area communication is a bit like this. It actually relies on the dominant uh, patterns of activity in V1 to be able to predict another subset of neurons in V1. So that's the main difference of V1, V2 communication. 
So where were the neurons, what layer in V1? Did, did you say? Uh, my anatomy is, two, I always forget it. The output layer. What is the two, output three, layer? Five, six, two, three, two, five, six. Five, six. Okay, output. Okay. okay. But, but you're missing a major input to layer four of V2 from V1. It comes from layer five of V1 through pulmonar to, to layer four. I'm wondering, how, you know, where that would fit in here. Yeah, I wonder too. I don't have an answer. We can, we, I'll be interested to uh, hear about that afterwards. Okay, that is certainly true. So one thing you have to remember is that V2 activity is, um, so in some sense this schematic is a bit wrong because I'm showing you that we predict all of V2 activity, but we don't. There's a lot of activity in V2 that we're not predicting from V1. Okay? That could be the other input. That could be the other input. So there are, there are other inputs to V1, but aren't you uh, to V2. Two, three input. Mm -hmm. well, we can talk about this. Yeah. You're, you're uh, uh, asking me too many questions. Uh -huh. did, did you say that you looked at different subsets of V1? Because it could be that some of the ones that you recorded from didn't actually go to V2. <coughs> so we checked for uh, so yeah, a receptive field. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, so we, we don't have the anatomy, right? But it turns out actually in, 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 in this study, but also in many other studies, it's maybe less of a problem because of all the core variability that you have between populations. So even though not many of these cells may actually project to V2, there may be cells that co-vary with cells that do project to V2, and that's why you can't do this type of analysis in the first place. Maybe you're gonna guess here, but uh, you know, I, I would, either of these can be private dimensions um, that aren't transmitted, or I, 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 you know, looking at these data, I would, I would call what's going on abstracting away the, the private dimensions, and it doesn't need the, the extra dimensions in V2 don't need to come from elsewhere. They can be constructed by V2, you know. Oh, that is, that is also true. Yeah, that is also yeah, true. So, so the same that is way totally true, yes. that V1 creates orientation, V2 will create something from dimensions. The information is in V1, but their combination so, in a way right. creates new dimensions. So it cannot, so it cannot really expand on the information that it gets from V1, uh, unless it has other inputs, of no, course. No, it doesn't expand. But, but uh, it, it, could, it could transform them in complicated nonlinear ways. Because if they were linear ways, we would capture them. But if they're transformations that are more complicated, then we would potentially but, not but, capture but, them with linear models. The, trans, the li nonlinearity can be just thresholds and, and boring things. The combinations can be linear and... and we can talk about it. But. Yes, 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 yes. Um, so let me just briefly state, so what could this actually be good for, okay? Um, and that brings me, why actually are we analyzing data at all? Like a bit, little bit of a philosophical thing, philosophical thing. So for me, what data analysis is supposed to be, first most is like a way of uh, looking at the data that actually gives you ideas for how to construct your theories. So I don't think like data analysis is gonna bring us all the way to understand the brain. I would say it's a way of making a connection to theories, right? You could say, well, I have my theory, and you know, with the theory I can break every single spike. Let's just say that will be beautiful, but we're not quite there yet. So we want to find an interface between the way we think about theories and the actual data. And so that's the way I think about uh, data analysis. So are you comparing and your <coughs> analysis to psychoanalysis? <laughs> data analysis to psychoanalysis. <coughs> yes. Okay. But well, you can say maybe there's nothing wrong with the, I mean, because I'm saying like there's nothing wrong with the data per se. It doesn't actually need to be analyzed, right? The data is correct. The reason we analyze it because we want to look at it in different ways. Um, okay, so here's a way of understanding why something like this could be useful. So imagine you had a source area and it has two targets, target area A, target area B. One possibility is that the way the errors communicate is in such a way, you have like these, the, the, these, each of these lines is now a neuron in one of these target areas, and they scan the activity space of the, of the source area in this way. So they're green neurons and they're red neurons. And now, if this happens and you start varying the activity in the source area, then what's going to happen is both target areas are going to see what happens in the source area. Okay? So there's, in some sense, everyone sees everything. On the other hand, if you have uh, these communication subspaces, and the communication subspaces are different for different downstream areas. So let's say, you know, the way the uh, uh, connectivity from, area, from the source area to the uh, downstream area B is set up is such that it reads out this bit of activity in the source space. And the way connectivity to area A is set up so that you read out 
activity in this manifold of the source space, then actually you can route information, okay? You, you, I mean, you, you, you move the problem, of course. In, in, this, in this case, you move the problem to the source area. You say it's the problem of the source area to make sure that the proper things are being communicated. So in this case, if the source area now varies in such a way um, that <clears throat> basic, I think actually this is the, this is the, ah, okay, no, it's, uh, sorry, I, gotta, I don't see the gray thing here, so I'm going to put my laser pointer maybe wrong. So this variation is orthogonal to this gray box here, okay, which you should see, I have a hard time seeing it, uh, which, is the, uh, which is the subspace of the downstream area B, okay? And since it's orthogonal to that subspace, it's private for area B and area B doesn't see anything. But this variation still projects onto the communication subspace of area A, so area A sees something. And alternatively, if the activity now varies orthogonal to uh, area A, then area B will see something and area A will see nothing. Okay? So it's one way of routing information between areas that doesn't put the problem on the connectivity, it just puts the problem on the area that wants to send information to different downstream targets. So it's not like the problem is soft, we just shifted it. Okay? Um, in my last five minutes, I want to just give a brief teaser, actually. Uh, so to summarize this, understanding inter communication by adjusting population activities, linear readouts allow to route information to different downstream targets. That's sort of the idea. So in all of these uh, methods, I've basically shown you uh, how to use linear readouts. This is a teaser because you guys have Sophie de Neff here for like I think two months and I thought you had given a talk already but maybe you will give a talk and then the teaser can be uh, uh, fulfilled. But it's work I basically did together with Sophie and many other people which I was uh, unable to put on the slide uh, before I did this morning. <clears throat> anyway, so let's start with this uh, linear readout again. So the linear readout is actually that something that started with the spikes. And in all of the stuff I've shown you, I kind of mysteriously left out the spikes because I always started with the firing rates. So we already did the filtering, we used the firing rates, and then we have these linear ways of basically combining them to find some kind of linear readouts. Okay? So, but let's bring the spikes back to the picture. So one thing you may wonder about, if we really think this is how it works in the brain, you can think as a linear readout as a, as a digital to analog conversion. You have these digital signals that are spikes, binary signals, you put them through the readout and it gives you a bunch of analog readouts, a bunch of analog variables. So one thing you may wonder about is how do you invert that transformation? How do you go, how does the brain go from these analog signals to these digital signals? Now obviously, that is not something that the brain necessarily has to do. Okay, I guess you could imagine that that is never explicitly done, but I'm going to advertise the idea that it may be useful to think about it. Okay, how would you do that? How would you go from these analog signals to these spike trains? So I think the first person that actually has done that is uh, Chris Eliasmith. And one thing um, I want to emphasize is this can actually not be linear. Okay, so, that, so for those of you who paid a lot of attention, you notice that <coughs> secretly we always assume that everything is linear in these methods, but you cannot go linearly back to the spike trains. There are basically two reasons. One reason is you know, because there are spikes, but you say, maybe I don't care. The other reason is because firing rates actually are quantities that are constrained to be positive. And in all of the methods we used, that actually never appeared, okay? So this transformation from some analog signal to a spike train, it has to be nonlinear. So as I said, the first one who basically did this is uh, Chris Eliasmith and uh, Charlie Anderson. They developed this neural engineering framework and one way of thinking about what they do in this context would be the following. Find a nonlinear transformation from these analog signals to the firing rates, and then transform every single firing rate into a spike train using something like a, a, a spiking uh, neuron model. Okay? The disadvantage of this, so this procedure works. The disadvantage of this procedure from the point of view of neuroscience is since you <clears throat> take these analog signals and transform them one by one into spike trains, all the spike trains turn out to be regular. Okay, they're all regular firing. And that's not what we see in the brain. So at some level, that can't be how it works. So 
So another way of thinking about how it works is to make the following two assumptions. You say, okay, what we actually want to do is we want to bound the error. So when we go back from these analog signals to these spike trains, and then we think about how we're going to read out those spike trains to get back to the analog signal, there will be an error. There will be an error because we had a discretization step in between. Okay, that's the minimum error you're going to make just because you discretize it into spikes. So you can say, let's assume that, the, that you want to bound the error, and let's assume that you want to be efficient with respect to some objective function. Now, efficiency sometimes, I think, sounds a bit strong. I would just actually, by now, rather say, let's bound the error, but not be totally dumb about it. Okay? So that would be the way I phrase efficiency. And if you do that, and that's my teaser, then there are three very interesting consequences that you get just from this pr uh, principle. Linear readout, you bound the error, and you want to be efficient you get that neurons should be coupled by lateral inhibition. You get that individual neurons are balanced in the excitatory inhibitory input, which in turn gives you irregular and unreliable spike trains. And you get, surprisingly, that these networks are robust. They're robust. They have instantaneous robustness against the loss of neurons, against synaptic mistuning, against noise, etc. So that's my teaser. If you find it unsatisfying, that's because it's a teaser. But as I said, you have Sophie here, and she can uh, give you all the details. So to summarize that, this was my little advertisement for linear readouts. I think, for me, they are basically invariant. I have not seen any reasons to change, uh, to go away from them. Um, so I would claim that's how it works. And that's it. Thanks for listening. <laughs> So in, in the teaser, uh, is this a problem? I mean, you created this problem of trying to predict what the spikes were that gave rise to this analog signal. Is that something the brain ever worries about or does? Is that is the brain concerned about this? Um, that's a much more complicated question. Let's say you can. So I think actually it may be concerned about it. There's a, there's a very beautiful paper from Raoul Sarpeshkar an engineer, I think, at, at MIT. I think he only wrote one paper in neuroscience uh, from 98. <clears throat> and so he makes the following comparison. So he compares brains to digital computers. And he says, in digital, like if you take a digital computer and you scale it up and think, let's make it as big that it can compute with as many bits per second as the brain. So you have to make a back of the envelope calculation for that. And then you say, okay, how much energy would the digital computer use? And I think it comes up with something that would be like a nuclear power station that you need to power the digital computer. Now, the brain uses supposedly only 12 watts. So there's like tens order of magnitude. This whole thing is off. And so the question is, why is it off by so many orders of magnitude? And so he said, OK, ideally, if you want to be energy efficient, you should use analog computation because you can use physics to compute. OK, that's what you want to do. But then. Everyone that has basically tried to build uh, VLSI chips, etc., was purely analog, always runs into the problem that you know noise builds up. So pure analog computation doesn't work either. So what, what he basically suggested is maybe what the brain does is basically an analog digital uh, hybrid where you use analog signals to compute, say on the dendrites, and then you use a discretization step so that you eliminate the noise, and you also make sure that things, when they travel over large distances, don't accumulate noise. And if you think about the architecture like that, then you actually do want to compute with analog signals. And you do want to not just have a transform from digital to analog, you also want to have the inverse transform. Uh, excuse me. Can't you just use a sigma delta modulator going back? I mean, Can we lose what? Sigma delta modulator. Um, that's, a very, that's a very interesting question. I'd be actually curious to talk. Because I think that the framework that I advertised but never explained, in some sense, shares some similarities with, I think, higher order uh, sigma delta modular, right. modularizers. So if you know something about them, I'd actually be curious to talk. Well, there are papers that suggest that what a neuron does is sigma delta modulation. Yeah, exactly. But we do it on the population level, right? That's the important thing. It's not a neuron by neuron thing. Yeah, it's not a neuron thing. It's a population level thing. Mm -hmm. So coming back to your V1, V2 uh, analysis, how do you ru rule out the, uh, the uh, uh, viring bottleneck? Well, by simulations. 
So like to rule out things, we can only just say, because we have the data, doesn't rule it out, right? So what we do is we basically set up a, a model for V1, a bunch of neurons for V1, set up a bunch of neurons for V2. We decide on a wiring diagram, and then we run our analysis on that model. And then if we see you know, that model doesn't spit out the same results, then it's being ruled out. But of course, you could say model space is infinite dimensional. So I would say the way we think about models, we say, OK, what would be a model that people would say that seems like a reasonable model for V1, V2 interaction? Because I mean, it's likely that there is a, a wiring model. Like, because I mean, there's layer 2, 3, uh, or the deep layers, they, they, have, they project to many other regions, right? So it's unlikely that every neuron that you recall from in V1 projects to V2. That's true. But it doesn't have to be. Because see, the thing is that the V1 activity is also not that high dimensional. It's like, it's like 6, 7, 8 dimensional. And so you have all this covariability of neurons in V1. So even if only a few of them project to V2, it doesn't actually change very much. Even if all of them put project to V2, it doesn't really change because you have this constraint activity space in V1 to start out with. Right? That's why you don't need full wiring. So if if the one activity space was badly going in all in full dimensionality, then a wiring diagram would actually you, provide you a bottleneck. The results are compatible with, with kind of a... Yeah, yeah they're, of course, they're compatible with, wiring. Uh, with wiring diagrams. I'm just saying the wiring diagram itself doesn't explain it. That's all. Sophie? Um, do you have the stimulus direction in the V1 activity? Yeah, that would be beautiful. So we're trying to figure it out, actually. The problem with figuring out this, so just to back up what the question is about, so we see these fluctuations in uh, V1, OK? So you may wonder, why are these fluctuations in V1? And I would say in the field, there are kind of two uh, alternative explanations. So one is, this is just feed forward noise. The reason V1 fluctuates around is because you know the processing from the retina to V1 may be noisy, or even the stimulus may not always be exactly the same location on the retina, which it won't, you know, because they're micro saccades and whatnot. Um, and that is the fluctuations that we see in the V1 population activity. An alternative explanation is that these fluctuations are generated internally in V1, okay, because of the way V1 is being wired. So I think Sophie's question is basically, can we see whether the stimulus subspace moves in the same uh, uh, <clears throat> manifold as the fluctuations we see, or whether it's orthogonal to those fluctuations? And it's an empirical question. It's not easy to answer, but I mean, we're, I'd, I'd say we're moving in that direction. One last question. The, the teaser that you mentioned is, is extremely exciting. So is there a paper about that? Which thesis? The, the, the teaser. Uh, the teaser, yes, there's a, there, there are papers about that. And there's also, like, I mean, I'm leaving on uh, Friday, but Sophia, I think, is here for another month, so she can give a talk about it. So this is a review paper we wrote in Nature Neuroscience um, about the papers that underlie this teaser. All right. Thanks a lot. <laughs>